Middleton, USA. Population 57,209 at the last census. A proud little city, yet no different from hundreds of others in this country. The old timers take pride in their city hall. They remember their fight to make Middleton the county seat. And the Hall of Justice is their badge of victory. As their town became a city, their churches reflected the growing religious needs of Catholics, Jews, and Protestants alike, no matter what denomination. A little red schoolhouse grew and became state normal and Central High. The old timers built their city with an eye to the future, always keeping pace with the times. Why did they do all this? There's your answer, for their children. They never lost sight of the fact that Middleton's future is in its young. Playgrounds were built where their young bodies could grow and gain strength. But remembering their own youth, the old timers know full well that there will come the dangerous years of adolescence, when playground games will seem like kid stuff, and when abounding energy will seek new outlets and will follow the leader of the moment in any direction. That's when their hopes rest in the new set of old timers, like Jeff Carter, who teaches history at Central High and has still found time to organize a boys club where his teenagers take their finals at becoming men. Why, right, Mr. Carter, I didn't know you admired my father so deeply. Hello, Connie. He'll be right there. Won't you sit down? I'll let you in on a secret. This isn't for your father. No. The travel folders say an orchid is standard equipment for a South American cruise. No girl should be without one. It's beautiful, Jeff. I wish it could last the whole six weeks. I'll have another one waiting for you when you get back. Does that mean you're not going east to study for a master's degree? I'm afraid I won't have time. Oh, Jeff. I know. But they needed me to teach history in summer school. Then there's my boys' club. I couldn't let that fold. Connie, must you argue with every young man who brings you orchids? But it's for his own good. My club has to stay open and you know it, especially during the summer. As long as I can keep my boys busy, I can keep them out of trouble. But what about yourself? It keeps me out of trouble, too. Dad, tell him what happens to people who work too hard. They usually become rich. But Jeff works for practically nothing. People who work for nothing become either saints or martyrs. <laughs> oh, there's no use talking to you. <laughs> I want you to see this. This makes five parents who've complained about that new jukebox hanging out on Highway Hill. Yes, I know. Go for a hole. You know, these places have run properly. They can be as good for the boys as my club. But five complaints. Do me a favor. Let me look the place over carefully before you take any action. All right, but do it soon. I will, because some of my own boys have deserted the club for the gopher hole. There, do the gentlemen approve? Beautiful. Yes, isn't she? Step on it, Willie. We'll never get there. Well, lay off, will you? You're making me nervous. But Danny said to be at the gopher hole early. You're just creeping along. Forget about Danny. Think of my father. I'm worried about what he'll do to me if I don't get his truck back before he gets home. Don't worry. We'll get it back, all right. Hey, look out! Be careful, will you? already here. You've got eyes. Do you see him? No. Well, then he's not here. Maybe something's wrong. Nothing's wrong. Am I late? What time is it? Where's Danny? You know, someday I'm going to take up a collection and buy you a watch. Oh, 
Well, Danny isn't here yet, is he? He's got eyes. Do you see him? Tammy McDonald, why do you always look half-dressed? Look, even your shirt's unbuttoned. Oh, I didn't have time. Dad made me sweep up the store. Doris, will you get out of here? We're on our own tonight. Suppose we let Danny decide that. I'll wait with you in our booth. Danny will be along in a minute. Getting ideas? Let's go, Jean. The air is better out there. Hey, Doris, don't forget your Sunday. You can finish it. Well, thanks. I didn't have time for dinner. Maybe you'd like a Coke to wash down the Sunday. No, thanks. Go ahead. I got money. All right. Oh, uh, miss. Two double Cokes. Who's paying? I told you I got money. And now you're blowing it on two Cokes. Double. My, my. You've made Evie jealous. Serves her right. She's always cracking about me being a cheapskate. I wish Danny would get jealous. Well, he'll never gets jealous unless he has cause. Here he comes. Our date was for tomorrow night. I had to see you, Danny. Will you see me? Not like that. No, I'll go inside. Hello, Danny. Oh, hello. How much? 40 cents? And a 10 cent tip. Thank you, Danny. Jean was just asking me if you were jealous, Danny. I'm not the jealous type. Uh, why don't you drink my Coke, uh, Danny? I'll see you later. What Coke's in that head of yours? Take me with you tonight, Danny. Uh -uh, this job's for men only. Please. Look, one of us has to be boss. Can't it be a partnership, Danny? Well, all right. Come on. What held you up? He's closing the deal. What deal? The fellow's gonna take the stuff off our hands while it's still hot. Easy, fellas. Lady's present. She's coming along. Who told you? Danny wouldn't let her in here if she wasn't coming. Uh-uh. Dar stays here. She's our alibi if anyone asks questions later. Oh, which truck did you get? The one tenner. Oh, that'll hold ten cases of perfume. Maybe you could hold out a bottle for me, Danny. <laughs> Too much trouble opening a case. I'll buy you more than you can use once we get our money. I'm gonna get me a movie camera. 16 millimeter. Oh, boy, I'm getting a motorcycle as soon as I get my money. Hiya, Jock. Look, boys, an honor. The owner himself is waiting on us. I never saw such a crowd. I'll have to put on more witnesses. Grab a chair, Jock, and tell us how you nearly won the Derby in 1923. I haven't got the time, boys. I haven't got the time. Now, mind what I say. If you're going to play cards, don't use money. Relax, Jack. I run a law-abiding police. Don't forget it. Don't you forget it. Well, Jack, what time is quit it? Quit me. 8.32. Going anywhere? Well, I've got to be home by 10. Oh, quit worrying. I'll get you home. Well, are we going to play or aren't we? Remember, no money. All right, we've got a witness that we were here at 8.32. You cover for us till we get back and don't let anyone in. I won't, Danny. Let's get a move on. Danny. Good luck, Danny. Thanks. You're quite a kid. if anything suspicious happens on the street. Okay, Danny. Phil and I go inside and open the door. Be careful of that burglar alarm. Let us worry about that. You better get to the corner, will you? Uh-huh. I hope the watchman's in back of the warehouse. What time is it? You're always worried about the time. Well, the watchman's upstairs and out of the way at 10 past 9. Oh. It's 10 past 9.
Mr. Carter. You little idiot. You can't take a warning, can you? Don't you realize what you're doing? How did you find out? Get out of here as fast as you can. Mr. Carter, don't go back there. They'll think I told him. I'm through trying to talk sense to you kids. Now go on home. I'll be with you tomorrow. Go on, beat it. Drop those cases, you hear? Drop them. It's Mr. Carter. You and Kenny, you and Tammy and Gene, get on home. Hurry up. Just a minute, Mr. Carter. Drop those cases. You, Danny Jones, you're coming along with me. Lay off, Carter. I'm through trying to reason with you, now I'm... Shut up, shut up. Scatter. Go on, meet at the gopher hole. Stop or I'll shoot. Anyone follow you? No. All right, mess the place up like a poker game's been going on. You must have caught Willie. Maybe you ran home. Anybody try to get in here while we were away? No, Danny. Good. All right, sit down, all of you. What about the truck? What about Willie? Yeah, what if he squealed? Our words as good as his. That's the stuff, Gene. Willie wasn't here at all. We played poker. All right, deal him up. Get outside, Doris. Let me stay, Danny, please. No, well, there might be trouble here. Maybe I'll see you later, Danny. Yeah, maybe. Now remember, you're our alibi. We played poker and Willie wasn't here at all. Yes, Danny. All right, I'll beat him. Danny, I need a drink. Oh, sure thing. Come on. Now, listen, they're having a thing on us. We've been here all the time. We played poker. Gene went all the dough and Tammy was the big loser. meeting last night on the Carter murder, we resolved that every culprit is equally to blame. Our committee feels that if one's guilty, they're all guilty. That's right. Well, they were indicted together. Why aren't they all being tried together? Every culprit must be made to pay. Agreed. But you allow Tammy, Phil, Gene, and the Miller boy to be bound over to juvenile court. Now, just a minute. The law in our state says that minors under 18 come under the jurisdiction of the juvenile court at the discretion of the judge. And Judge Raymond ruled that Danny Jones, who is not a minor, is to be tried alone. But, Mr. Burns, what about... Don't worry. It doesn't mean the miners won't be punished. What about Danny Jones? Are you going to prosecute him yourself, Mr. Byrne? Yes. Besides, Jeff Carter was my personal friend. You can be sure I won't rest until his murderer is convicted. Extra! Read all about it! Extra! Extra! May it please the court? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, on July 27th, Jeff Carter was murdered. You've been selected by both sides in this trial to judge and determine the guilt or innocence of Danny Jones, the accused. As your elected representative, it is my duty to present the facts I have gathered in order to prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that Danny Jones is guilty as charged. I'll bring before you competent witnesses to prove that Danny Jones organized a gang of juveniles and led them in a life of crime that Jeff Carter found out what the accused was up to, 
and the two men clashed. And when they did, Jones made threats against Carter's life. That during a robbery attempt on the warehouse at 19 Front Street on the night of July 27th, Jones made good his threat. These facts constitute premeditated murder. There is no alternative. The penalty is death. Danny Jones gave Jeff Carter no alternative because there is never a compromise between good and evil. Jeff Carter was good. We of Middleton applauded his fight against delinquency. We supported his efforts in organizing boys clubs to bring our sons through the dangerous years of adolescence. We warm to the magnetism of his entire being. You will see in due time the evil that is Danny Jones. The state's first witness will be Dr. Oliver Hughes. testimony you're about to give before this court, you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, self you guard. I do. Your name? Dr. Oliver Hughes. What is your occupation, Dr. Hughes? Coroner of Middleton County. How long have you held this position? Eight years. Were you called upon to examine a body on the night of July 27th? Yes, the body of Jeff Carter. What manner of examination were you called upon to perform? The cause of death. And your findings? That Jeff Carter died of a bullet wound in the region of the heart. Were you able to determine the time of death? I arrived on the scene at 9.40. Jeff Carter had been dead not more than 30 minutes. Sometime in the neighborhood of 9.10. That is correct. That's all. Your witness, Mr. Weston. No questions. Leo Emerson to the stand. Thanks, Dad. Raise your right hand. In the testimony you're about to give before this court, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, help you guard? I do. Your name? Leo Emerson. Sit down, please. How old are you, Leo? Seventeen. Are you still in school? Yes, sir. I'm a senior at Central High. You knew Jeff Carter? Yes. How well? Very well. Do you know the defendant? Very well. When did you first meet Danny Jones? It was last May. How did you meet him? Uh, a bunch of us were playing basketball at the club. What club? Mr. Carter's boys club. I remember I was choosing sides against Phil. I'll take George. I'll take Willie. Uh, Gene. Tammy. Uh, Ronnie. Bruce. And Jim. Johnny. Stick around, fellas. We'll be yelling for subs all along. Say, you uh, need a referee? Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Come on. I'm Leo Emerson. That's Phil Kenny, captain of the other team. Uh, hiya, fellas. I'm Danny Jones. Here, let me have the ball. Oh, you're not long for this world. Hey, you ready, fellas? Okay, here we go. Come on, come on. Come on. Somebody get a pet. I'll get the pump. Uh-uh, you can't fix that. Why don't you get a new ball? We just chipped in for the baskets. What do these things cost? Twelve bucks. Oh, is that all? Oh, no. Don't be a sap. I can afford it. Here, pick up a new ball. Compliments of Danny Jones. That's Here, what I can with it. Say, uh, who runs this gym? Jeff Carter. Want to join? Uh-uh, not me, thanks. What's the matter with you? <laughs> it's okay for kids, I guess. And how old are you? Old enough to vote. You're new in town, aren't you? Uh-huh. I've got a job at the gopher hole. That broken down old joint. I wouldn't be caught dead in it. If you ask me, it stinks. Well, maybe it did once, but you ought to see it now. I talked to Boston of fixing it up. Regular nightclub for kids with a jukebox and malts instead of liquor. Say, that sounds like a sharp idea. Yeah, it's the kind of club I go for. Uh, when do you open up? Well, next week we've been advertising in the papers. Come on over opening night. I'll buy you all drinks and bring your girls along. Here. Sure. Okay. Okay. Right. Sounds like a good deal, deal boy. The gopher hole made a hit right off the bat. There wasn't a girl in town that didn't want to go out there. It made them and us all feel sort of grown up. It wasn't long before Danny got to be the most popular guy in town. When he said hello to you, you felt sort of important. And when he invited you into the back room for cards, everyone else was jealous. Card games? What kind of cards? Poker, mostly. For money? Yes. A few minutes ago, you said you didn't have $12 for basketball. Where'd you get the money for poker? Danny taught us how to rob gas stations and stuff like that. 
Did you and these boys make up a regular gang for that purpose? Yes. Who else was in the gang besides you and the defendant? Gene Spooner, Phil Kinney, Tammy McDonald, and Willie Miller. Why did you join? I needed money. Why? It, it was personal. You'll have to tell us, Leo. My mother and father separated. Dad went to live in another state. Yes? Mother got a job at the grocery store. I never saw her much, and she was always tired. I wasn't allowed to quit school and go to work, and I had to earn my way somehow. So I joined the gang. Were you still a member of the gang on the night Jeff Carter was killed? No, sir. I quit two weeks before. What made you quit? Dad came back home. Did you ever see Danny after your father came home? Yes. I took Mr. Carter out to the gopher hole one night. Why? He wanted me to. He said he was worried about some of the fellas. Which ones? Gene, Tammy, Phil, and Willie. I was kind of worried about him, too, so I went out there with him. You, him. I came out to look the place over. I've been wanting to meet you. Well? Maybe I can give you a hand with the work you're doing. I don't need a hand. Well, you're lucky. I need all the help I can get. You came to the wrong place. Maybe I didn't. I'm offering you a job. Me? I've got a job right here. This one's taking care of youngsters ages 7 to 12. I'm no nursemaid. I'm not looking for a nursemaid. I'm looking for someone who can be a leader. Kids of that age need your help. What do they got parents for? Well, maybe some of them need help. Why? Well, some are too busy. Others are too poor. But why should their children be penalized for something that's no one's fault? Why shouldn't kids be given a break? Yeah, it's an angle. The club could keep a lot of youngsters from learning a lot of wrong things. What makes you think I teach them the right things? Well, you teach them baseball, football, how to get along with other kids. They'll learn by your example. No preaching? I don't believe in preaching, unless it's practiced. Well. I'm not interested, Mr. Carter. In a few months, you'd be a hero to those boys. Who wants to be a hero to a bunch of brats? Those brats have a knack of catching on to phonies. Maybe that's what you're afraid of. I wouldn't try that again, Jones. Well, Danny, how about it? There's a job like yours for every man in this room. Wrong number. Try next door. It's either that or get out of town, Jones. Get in my way, Carter. I'll take care of you. You don't worry me a bit. I'm not going to let you ruin the lives of these boys. Come on, Leo. And that was the last time you saw Danny Jones before Jeff Carter was killed? Yes, sir. Thank you, Leo. Your witness. Leo, you testified that before you met Danny Jones, you were the leader of the boys. Is that so? Yes. You like being a leader, don't you? Why, yes. And there isn't much room for two leaders in anything, is there? No. Objection. This line of questioning has nothing to do with the case. Your Honor, the prosecutor was allowed to establish the enmity between my client and Jeff Carter. I propose to establish the enmity between my client and this witness. The questions are allowable. Proceed. Thank you. Leo, you said you liked being a leader. Now, how did it feel watching your friends look up to Danny Jones instead of yourself? Oh, no, that isn't what I meant. I meant... You were envious? No, I was sore. Oh, sore. No more questions. May step down, Leo. Mr. Burns? Your Honor, may I approach the bench with the defense counsel? You may. The other three juveniles have decided to stand on their constitutional rights, but the Miller boy has chosen to testify. Very well. William Miller to the stand. Over there, please. 
Raise your right hand. The testimony you're about to give before this court, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, help you God? I do. Your name? Willie Miller. Sit down, please. Willie, do you understand that you don't have to answer any questions in this court that might incriminate you in your own trial, which is coming up? Yes, sir. Proceed, Mr. Burns. How old are you, Willie? Seventeen, sir. Have you finished school yet? No, sir. I, I'm a junior at Central High School. Do you know the defendant? Danny Jones? Yes, sir. How well do you know him? Well, I was a member of his gang. Can you remember what you did on the night of July 27th? Yes, sir. I, I went to the gopher hole. How'd you get there? I drove my father's truck. Did he consent to your taking it? No, sir. Did he know that you took it? No, sir. You'll have to speak up so the jury can hear you. No, sir. I had to wait till he and Ma went to one of their parties. Why did you take the truck? Danny told me to, so we could haul the perfume cases from the warehouse. Were you doing this for pay? No, sir. We were going to steal them. Who was going to steal them? Phil Kenny and Tammy McDonald, Gene Spooner, and Danny Jones and I. Who drove the truck? I did. Who else was in the truck? Phil and Gene and Tammy and Danny Jones. What part did you take in the robbery attempt? Well, I was a lookout at the end of the alley. Where were the others? Well, they all went into the warehouse. Did you see them enter? Yes, sir. Then what happened? Well, I just got in set when Mr. Carter caught me. What did Mr. Carter do? He shook me and bawled me out and told me to go on home. But instead of going, I waited until he'd gone into the warehouse, and then I followed as far as the loading platform. Did you see or hear what went on inside the warehouse? Well, I didn't see anything, but I heard Mr. Carter bawling the other fellows out like he did me. Do you remember what he said? He told him to drop those cases, and he said, Phil Kenny, you and Gene and Tammy go on home. And he said, Danny Jones, you're coming with me. I'm through trying to reason with you. Then what happened? Then I heard the shot. Could you tell where the shot came from? From inside the warehouse. When you heard the shot, what did you do? I got scared and ran away. That's all. Your witness? Willie, you say you were scared when you ran away from the warehouse. Yes, sir, I was. Where did you go when you ran away? I went home. Did anything happen on the way home? I don't know, sir. I ran all the way. Was anyone at home when you got there? Well, speak up, son. You're not afraid, are you? Or are you? Willie, you have nothing to be afraid of. This court is here to protect those who tell the truth. You understand that, don't you? Yes, sir. Very well. Who was at home when you got there? My dad was there. Tell us what happened then. Well, I, I thought he was still at the party, but he'd come home for something. Why aren't you in bed? Scared you, didn't I? No, you're home. What have you been up to? Who's been chasing you? No one. I... I've been out with Leo. Yeah, Leo. I... I didn't know it was so late. Late? It's an hour past your bedtime. Now, go in your room right this minute. Yes, sir. See who it is. Go ahead. Open the door. Miller. What's the matter? Do you want a one-ton meat truck license number 65565? Yes. Why? You know where it is now? In the garage? No, it isn't right now. It's at Connor's warehouse. It was involved in a burglar and... That's why you're out of breath. You were running away. Uh, uh, no, Dad. You better tell us the truth, young fellow. I'm telling the truth. I didn't do it. You're lying. I'm not. I didn't take the truck. We'll see about that. You 
wait here. I'll make him talk. You're crying already, and you aren't even hurt. You're no good, Willie. I always knew you were no good. You're no son of mine. talk now. Go on, tell him. I, I took the drug tonight. Were you alone? Did you have someone with you? No, there were some others. Who are they? Danny Jones, Phil Kenny, Gene Spooner, and Tammy McDonald. What about Leo? Leo wasn't with us. I was lying. Where are they now? Back at the Gopher Hole, I think, in the back room. Then they, they took me to the police station. That's all, Willie. You may step down. Uh, just a minute, Willie. The jury will be excused. Mr. Burns, were you aware of the method that was used to extract this information? No, Your Honor. That's all, Mr. Burns. Willie, are the two men who arrested you in the court? No, sir. Is your father in court, Willie? Yes, sir. Mr. Miller. Come up here. Stand in front of your son. Keep looking at him. Mr. Miller, your disgraceful actions cannot be tolerated in this day and age. A man has a right to whip be his own... Be quiet or I'll cite you for contempt of court. Look at your son, sitting here afraid of the very sight of you. Lonely for the companionship you denied him. Forced out into the street to find that which wasn't in your home or your heart. Look at him and realize that it was you that forced him out of your house. That but for you, he wouldn't be here. And if this court ever hears of you threatening or mistreating this boy again, I'll see that you get the maximum punishment. Officer, remove this person from my courtroom. Step down, Willie. I want those two arresting officers brought to me without delay. Court adjourned until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Yes, sir. Why, hello, Miss Burns. Hello, Alec. How was the trip? Did you learn to speak Spanish in South America? And Portuguese, too. Your dad will be glad to see you. Then I saw some boys run out and down the alley. Oh, I took my gun and fired it. You down front? What did you do after yes, you fired those boys you saw running down the alley? Well, I couldn't chase them because I didn't dare leave the warehouse. So I did the next best thing. I called the police and told them about the Miller truck and finding the dead man. I see. Your witness? <sighs> I hope we're not boring you, Mr. Adamson. No, but you're keeping me up. I ought to be asleep at this hour. <laughs> Maybe you can stay awake long enough to answer a few questions. Well, I'll try. Very well, Mr. Adamson. Now, you testified that you heard a shot, that you ran to the first floor of the warehouse, that you saw some boys run out and down the alley, and that you fired on them. Is that right? That's right, that's right. How many boys did you see? Well, I'm not sure. Well, were there three, seven, or ten? Well, I don't know. You see, it was dark in the alley, and the boys were running. How do you know they were boys? Well... Did you tell me their ages? No. Were they nine, 19, or 90? Well, they weren't 90. Oh. <laughs> Well, that narrows it down considerably. Did you recognize any of them? No, I told you it was dark in the alley. I asked you if you recognized any of them. No. Can you identify the defendant as one of them? No. That's all. <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. Granby, what is your occupation? Sergeant of police, assigned in charge of fingerprint division, record bureau. How long have you been so assigned? Six years. Were you called upon to take fingerprints on the night of July 27th? Yes, sir, I was. Among those prints was the defendant's one of them? Yes. Are these the prints? Yes, this is a print of Jones' left index finger taken while in custody. This is a print of a left index finger taken from a packing case at Connor's warehouse. How many points of exact similarity have you found in those two prints? Twelve. Apple to establish they came from the same hand. Thank you. That's all. Your witness. May I see those pictures? Just for the record, Sergeant, is this the print you took from the packing case? Yes. The only one you could get? Yes. Well, isn't this somewhat blurred? Uh, yes, but you see, That's I... All. Burns. The state rests. Court adjourned until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. See you tomorrow, Danny. That'll get you 50. I'll be here. Me too. Don't you remember the orphanage at Clifton? I was the little girl who was always with you. Sorry, sister. What's that you said about an orphanage, Miss Burns? Danny and I were children together. He took care of me. Why didn't... Come on, dear. You must be tired from your oh, trip. Dad! Did you adopt were they really together Burns? together Give us a lowdown, Mr. Burns. Oh, some other time, Freddie. Dad, that's Danny! I know it. There's nothing I can do. Oh, well, we've got to do something for him. We'll talk about it later. Why the brush off, Mr. Burns? Did you send your daughter out of town because of Danny? Well, what a story. How long since they've seen each other, How old were they, Mr. Burns? Is this going to make any difference in the prosecution? All right. I'll, I'll give you the story. a boy, Mr. Burns. In Judge Raymond's chambers. Come on, dear. When I was 19, just starting my law course, I met Cynthia, Connie's mother. We fell in love, and I persuaded her to marry me. But when I took her as my bride to Long Island to meet my family, they refused to see her. There was an annulment. My family offered Cynthia a settlement, but she wouldn't take a dime from them or from me. She just disappeared without letting any of us know there was going to be a child. About 10 years ago, I got a message from Anna Templeton, a matron in an orphanage somewhere in Ohio. She was there when the doctors told Cynthia she couldn't live. And Cynthia made a promise to keep Connie's birth a secret from me. Miss Templeton registered the baby as an orphan, took a job with the home to be near her. Connie was a sickly child, and when she was 10, her condition became extremely serious. That's when Miss Templeton broke her promise and sent for me. She had proof that Connie was my daughter. This ring, I had given it to Cynthia. And uh, this lucky charm were among the things that were left. I took Connie to a famous clinic. After they started her on her cure, we settled in Middleton on their advice. That's the story, and I'm not proud of it. All right, Connie, they want to hear about Danny now. After I left the orphanage, I never got a chance to say goodbye to Danny. The first thing I remember, I was taken downstairs to meet my father. I called for Danny, but they said it would be bad if he knew where I was being taken, so I never got to say goodbye. I had so much to thank him for. As long as I can remember, he protected me. He kept the other children from teasing me. He made them play games I could play. He never left my side when I was sick. Twice he kicked people in the shins for trying to adopt him without taking me along. He was more than a brother to me. He took the place of a whole family. After we came here and I got well, I wrote him letters every day, but they were never answered. I found out why when Miss Templeton returned my letters in an envelope and said that Danny had taken to running away. And this last time, they were unable to find him. Now you see how good he is. I've got to help him. There must be some way. I'm afraid there's nothing you can do, my dear. Of course, you're at liberty to put her on the stand. Thank you, Your Honor, but her testimony won't help the case. Besides, Danny's a long way from being convicted. Well, there's your story. No, it isn't, Your Honor. It's Mr. Burns' story. As far as my newspaper's concerned, it belongs in the past. What do you say? It goes for my paper, too. Mine, too.
speaking already? No, I've been listening to the story of your boyhood. It must have been interesting. Yes, it was. Why didn't you recognize Connie when she spoke to you? The girl out in the court? She made a mistake. No, she didn't, Danny. She recognized you as the boy that was with her in the orphanage, and so did her father. Who's he? The district attorney, Mr. Burns. You mean... You mean he's the one who took her away from the orphanage? That's right. Don't you want to hear about it? Yeah, go ahead. I haven't got anything else to do but eat this stew. And she's still in there, trying to find some way to help you. Can I have a smoke? Sure. Keep the pack. You must have been a good kid, Danny, to have her remember you so clearly. Well, she was a sweet little thing, always kind of helpless. That guy Burns, he sure did all right by Connie. Proceed with the defense. Ready, Your Honor? Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the state has attempted, in a roundabout and confusing manner, to prove Danny Jones guilty of murder in the first degree. But the truth is a simple thing, arrived at without devious twistings and turnings. I can assure you that before this court day is over, you will have heard the case for Danny Jones. It is that simple. I will bring but one witness to the stand, and she will prove with competent testimony that Danny Jones did not leave the gopher hole on the night of July 27th, and therefore could not have been at the scene of the crime. Doris Martin to the stand. Is uh, this the place where they're holding the trial of Danny Jones? Yes, ma'am. Oh, could you tell me who to give this to? You can't see him until after the recess, Miss Templeton. Let's come in and wait. Raise your right hand. The testimony you're about to give before this court, you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth to help you guard? I do. Your name? Doris Martin. You. Sit down, please. How old are you, Doris? Seventeen, nearly. Do you have an occupation? I'm still in school, a junior. Do you know the defendant? Yes. How long have you known him? Since May. How well do you know him? I love him. Doris, love is an odd word. It has different meanings to different people. Will you tell the jury just why you love Danny Jones? Well, it all started because I was so lonesome. A girl like you? There just wasn't anyone. Mother isn't alive, you see. When I was 15, father got married again, and he and his wife took to going away on trips without me. Well, you were left in someone's care. We had a maid, but she went out on dates nearly every night. You mean you were left at home alone? I didn't stay home. I went out on dates, too. Did you have any girlfriends? Yes, but after a while, they all got jealous. How often did you go out? Every night for nearly a year. Then I stopped. Why did you stop? It wasn't fun any longer. There was no one who loved me. That's why I was so lonely. I see, Doris. I don't think you do. When you're that lonesome, you get to feeling mad and mean inside. When I met Danny, I knew right away he was different from anyone else. He was kind and, and gentle and sort of, sort of grateful. I think we understand, my dear. How often did you see Danny? Whenever I could. Almost every afternoon and evening. When was the last time that you were together? The night they arrested him. Were you alone? No. We were in the back room at the gopher hole. Who else was present? Phil and Jean were there, and Tammy. Was Willie Miller with you? No. Was he there earlier? Not that night. What went on in the back room that night? The boys played cards, and I sat behind Danny and watched. What time did the card game start? At 8.32. I remember because Tammy asked Jock Neely the time. And how long did you watch the card game? 
until about 10.30. Then I left. Did you leave the back room at any time between 8.32 and 10.30? No, sir. Did Danny or Phil or Tammy or Jean leave, even for a moment, during those hours? No. That's all, Doris. Doris, if it was a question of life or death, would you tell a lie for Danny? Yes. I'm sure you haven't told any lies, but there are certain facts I want to clear up. Yes, sir. Will you name the boys who were in the back room of the gopher hole once more? There was Danny, Tammy, Phil, and Jean. And no one else? Only Jock Neely when he brought in the malts. There was no other boy there that night? No, no other boy. Do you know Willie Miller? Yes. How well do you know him? We grew up together. Does Willie drive a car? Once in a while, his father lets him use the delivery truck. Would you recognize it if you saw it? I don't know. When did you last see it? I don't remember. Did you see it July 27th? No. Was Willie in the back room July 27th? No. Who was in the back room that night? Danny, Tammy, Phil, and Jean. I forgot Jock Neely. I thought you only meant the boys. Boys? What boys? Danny, Tammy, Phil, and Jean. When did you last see Willie's car? I don't know. When did you last see Willie Miller? I don't remember. What time did the boys come back from the warehouse? I don't remember. Uh, was Willie with them when they came back? No. Was it with them Jack. when they left the back room? No. Your Honor, the prosecutor is deliberately trying to put words into this girl's mouth in an effort to bewilder and confuse her. This isn't a third degree, it's a jury trial. Sustained. You will frame your questions in accordance with full legal procedure. Strike out the last three questions. I apologize to the court. Do you know Willie Miller? No, yes. Come, Doris, do you know Willie? Yes, I mean yes. On the night of July 27th, who was with you in the back room of the gopher hole? Willie, Dad. Willie? No, not you Willie. You said Willie? You got me all mixed up. Who was up. in the back room? Your Honor, the witness is obviously in no condition to go on. I ask that the court be recessed for 30 minutes. Denied. All right, Doris, tell me, who was in that back room on the night of July 27th? I can't. I can't tell you anymore. Was Willie there that night? Yes, yes. Oh, leave me alone. Please leave me alone. Not till we know the truth. Yes, he was there. They didn't play cards at all. They went around the warehouse. Oh, Danny, Jesse. I couldn't help it. I didn't know what I would say any longer. I couldn't lie. Test for 30 minutes. <laughs> Connie, Connie, take care of this child, please. Yes. Hey, God, get me out of here. I know a cozy spot where you can get a lethal cocktail, Burns. I need one. What else did you do? You certainly fooled me with that cooked-up story of yours. I'll lay off. I have a reputation for defending innocent men. When I take a case, I believe in my client. That's why I win. You're giving up now? In here, Miss Templeton. Don't leave me alone with her. Hello, Danny. How did you get here? What do you want? I've been reading about you in the papers. I just had to come and see you. I'm Anna Templeton. I used to be Danny's nurse at the orphanage. How do you do? Is it possible to be alone with him? I've got nothing to say to you. You have 20 minutes, Miss Templeton. You haven't changed, Danny. You have. You've gotten old. I've been very ill lately. What did you come here for, anyway? To preach to me? No, Danny. Well, then what do you want? Do you mind if, if I sit down? No, go ahead. Danny, what I have to say to you is very important. You must listen to me. Look, if you've got something on your mind, tell me and get it over with. You've every right to treat me this way. It's my fault that you're here now. All oh, that. Don't go into that. I know the whole story. Oh, no, you don't. You can't. Burns let the secret out of the bag yesterday. My lawyer told me everything. No one knows the secret but me. And I haven't broken my word to your mother yet. My mother? Yes. Cynthia Burns was your mother. That man out there, the district attorney, he's your father. Edgar Burns' son. 
me. I had to do it. The doctor said Connie would die if she stayed in the orphanage, and I knew Mr. Burns would take good care of her if he thought she was his child. Oh, no. Well, I can't forgive myself for what he did to you, Danny. I shouldn't have meddled. I should. <laughs> go tell your secret to the old man. See how he takes it. I want your forgiveness. Go on, go on, go tell him. There isn't any time. Go on, get a move on. Tell him, tell everybody. Tell him what a big joke you played on me. Tell him what a big joke it is on Burns. Tell him what a big joke it'll be on Connie. Wait a minute. You're lying. This is some kind of trick. No, Dad. Yes, it is. That Burns, he's got brains. How about the birth certificate? How did you fake that? Go on, tell me. You never had a name. Your mother gave them a false name. How about Connie's mother? Connie was a foundling. We named her at the home. We can't tell them. We can't tell anybody. Oh, we've got to. He has a right to know. He's your father. Look, Miss Temple. Once the cards are dealt, you have to play the hand out. It wasn't in the cards for me to win. I fought to get him shuffled again, but it wasn't any use. The hand I'm playing was stacked against me way back there when... when my father was a kid. But he must know that he's sending an innocent boy to his death. He's your father. We've got to... Listen, Miss Templeton. I did it. Whatever's coming to me, I deserve. I killed Jeff Carter. Yes, I killed, killed him in cold blood. If you tell your story now, it won't do any good at all. It'll only ruin the lives of two swell people. Connie and, and my father. Promise me one thing. Keep that secret till your dying day. I promise, then. You always hated tears, didn't you? I guess I can stand on this once. Are there any other witnesses for the defense? The defense rests. The district attorney may proceed with the closing argument. Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, when I opened this trial before you, I said I was going to prove through competent witnesses that Danny Jones killed Jeff Carter. It has now been proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that Danny Jones is guilty of premeditated murder as charged. Every soul in this courtroom knows that Jones is guilty. Danny Jones is like a weed that poisons the healthy, useful plants in the garden. The way to eliminate a poisonous weed is to destroy its roots. But Danny Jones' roots were entangled with those of Leo Emerson, Willie Muller, poor little Doris Martin, and the others. I could get at Jones only through those children. He had infected them with his poison. Before you go into that jury room to consider your verdict, you should be profoundly thankful that the poison of Danny Jones' breed did not enter the blood of your sons and daughters. And there can be no mercy for this vicious little big shot who was so bent on twisting and blighting and poisoning the character and fiber of our boys and girls that he could not stop short of the premeditated murder of Jeff Carter, the real friend of our youth. Danny Jones is heartless. His mind is warped, his blood is bad, and he's a killer. Under the law, he must pay the penalty of death for this inexcusable and cold-blooded murder. No, no. You can't. You can't kill him. You have to hear me. I have something to tell you. No, don't listen to it. It's all right, of course. You have to listen to it. She can't tell you anything you don't know already. Don't let her talk you. What's stop her? Quiet, please. If you have testimony of value to this case, why haven't you offered it before? I, I just arrived. I came as soon as I could. It's incumbent upon us that we hear what this lady has to say. Bring her to the witness stand. You've got to listen to me first. I'll tell you what she's going to say. I killed Jeff Carter. Yes, I shot him and threw the gun on the hedge at 32nd and Main. Nobody knew I had the gun, not even those kids. They didn't know anything. I poisoned them just like he said I did. I even fooled my lawyer. She knows what I am, but she can't tell if I tell you first. Don't let her talk. Don't let her talk. Quiet. Another demonstration of this sort, and I'll clear the courtroom. All right, Miss Templeton. Dead.
Will the defendant rise? Have you anything to say before I pass sentence? Yes, Your Honor. But first, let me express my thanks for your acceptance of my explanation with respect to Doris Martin's testimony. If I had known that this case was based on a lie, I wouldn't have taken it. Now I'm thankful I didn't know. Because there is more to this trial than the mere conviction of a young man who has admitted his guilt. I want to speak in explanation for Danny Jones, rather than in defense of him. Because in his explanation lies the mitigation for his crime. We boast that every American is born with an equal chance. By an equal chance, we mean a decent home, loving and dutiful parents, and an adequate education with which to start him on the road to becoming a useful member of the community. How much of this did Danny Jones receive? Did he have what we consider a decent home? No. For no matter how hard we try, we can't include parental love and understanding in the structure of an orphanage. We can only provide shelter and education. The record shows that Danny Jones spent most of his time running away. But he didn't try to escape because of inherent badness. He ran away in search of affection when the one person he loved was taken from him. Now, what about his parents? Who are his parents? Where are his parents? No one knows, not even Danny Jones. Can you now say, Danny Jones, I judge you with the same measuring stick as I would someone who had all those advantages. Would that be giving Danny Jones the break that we Americans insist everyone is entitled to? We must understand Danny Jones when we judge him. We must recognize him as the symbol of so many others to whom we must somehow supply the advantages that are the birthright of every American boy and girl, not only for their sakes, but for the ultimate good of the American community. That is the explanation for Danny Jones. He's ready for sentence. Thank you, Mr. Weston. When the terms of a sentence are left to the discretion of the court, as the laws of our state provide, the judge must weigh every aspect of the case with utmost care. This I have done. Danny Jones, you stand convicted of the crime of first-degree murder. It is the judgment of this court that you be confined to the state penitentiary for the rest of your natural life. Court adjourned. Danny? The law offers a reward for good behavior, even for those serving a life term. I hope you take advantage of it. We'll be working for you, Danny. My father and I. I hated him until I saw you that day. Funny how easy it is to change your mind. You don't hate him anymore? I couldn't if I tried. After all, he's your father. 